find ourselves overwhelmed, weighed down, weighed down, or, or even crushed. It's hard to breathe under the weight of our anxieties. It's difficult to move forward when we're anchored to our worries. But God loves us too much to let us stay this way. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to throw off the group just uh, a little bit. Um, uh, for those of you who haven't been here um, uh, for probably three or four years, uh, we haven't done this for a couple of years, um, where uh, Jim and myself get up, and we just kind of have a, a, a very real, very raw, uh, unfiltered conversation uh, over a spiritual topic. And uh, right now, we're working our way through the Sermon on the Mount, and we're in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, and there's actually a little spot where Jesus kind of has an editorial comment on forgiveness. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to take um, a few moments today and work through that one little item that, that, that Jesus talks about that uh, in many ways brings a little bit of anxiety to our lives. So, um, yeah, anxiety is, is, is the right term. I, uh, talking about forgiveness, uh, the interesting things that, that happens, and it's really happened a lot this time, is, is uh, we, get anxiety. we get anxiety because we know that as, as a whole, most of the people in this room have, have had some interactions with struggling to forgive right. someone, right? Most of the people in this room have had battles. Um, when, we get, when we get up and talk about prayer, everybody in the room will say, yeah, I know, I probably need to pray. Right? When, when we get up and we talk about, you know, giving or being generous, most of us will be like, yeah, you know, I've, I've got this and this and this and this is my struggle, but I, I know that I need to do that because it's good for my for my spirit. When we get up and we talk about forgiveness, actually here the last, uh, in the last few weeks, um, we've had multiple people from the church contact us. Well, yes, I, I know that the Bible says that I should forgive, but do I really need to forgive if this has happened? Or do I really need to forgive if this is my story? Um, I don't think you understand how hard this is. I don't think you understand. We've had people say those things. I don't think you understand the struggle that comes, right, with, with just how hard it is to forgive. And if we're being honest, most of us in this room know what that means, right? We know that battle of somebody doing something or having said something. And so it's, it's something we deal with in our daily lives. It's really, really uncomfortable. Um, and so it's really better that we talk about it this way so we can have that honest conversation. I, I would agree with that. Um, in fact, um, when we were planning, or actually a couple of months out from preaching through the Sermon on the Mount, um, Jim had actually heard of churches that were preaching from the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, members of their church literally were saying, where are you getting this garbage? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, it, it's so countercultural. It's so um, it has so much of what Jesus talks about goes against the grain of how we want to operate in our life. And uh, so we kind of expected that somebody might come up and say, "Well, where did you get this garbage?" And we were going to say the Bible. Um, but we have again had so many pre-conversations about forgiveness. Uh, it's actually been surprising, and uh, I think it's not been from an issue of. Uh, a pushback, of pushback or even anger, but I'm going to use the word angst, yeah. where people, where people really truly have a lot of anxiety because this is such, this a, is personal such a personal conversation. conversation. This, is personal this is such a personal issue because we all know what it's like to like a right i mean we know that you know all of us again most of us in this room have had some struggles and and, and real brokenness has been really hurt let's let's be honest this morning, right I, I think there's probably people in this room who uh struggle to forgive uh, lots of different things right there's, there's parents who have said or done terrible things i've, I've got those things that i've about in my own life maybe it's siblings uh ex-spouses or spouses right now or our, our children or Look, even being honest, I mean, there are probably people in this room who are harboring anger or struggles to forgive people like us who have ministry who have manipulated them, 
right? Who, who may have said, well, you just have to do this, or you need to do this, and spiritually manipulated them. And now uh, I, I imagine that there are people in this room who are sitting there thinking, I don't know that I want to listen to you now, because I don't know that I can trust you, right? So the, the forgiveness, the reality of this um, is a hard thing. And so I think that's why this is going to be such a great conversation, right, as we go ahead and start to dig into Matthew um, and dig into the way of Jesus. As we dig into that, we'll see why Jesus is saying this. And see that, please understand, these are not our words this morning. We're having a conversation, but we're really wanting this to be based completely on what Jesus says. Uh, so follow along in the Bible. Follow along. Go and dig in afterwards um, and, and look at what we're saying. See, um, challenge us in these things. We want to be able to share the truth. We're going to be starting in Matthew 6. Uh, we'll hear uh, a few different passages this morning in the conversation. Um, but really see that the truth here is not something that leaders like us have just tried to manipulate. We want to see where Jesus' truth is. So, cool. So, um, when I say I read a book, that usually means I listen to a book. I listen to a lot of books. I don't read a lot of books. So, um, I use that kind of interchangeably. Uh, but I heard something a few weeks ago, um, and I'm trying to think of the name of the book. Uh, I think it's called uh, uh, The Remaking of the World, stuff that happened in 1776 that we're still feeling the ripple effects of uh, in the world today. But one of the things that the guy mentioned, uh, what I thought was very, very profound from a Christian perspective, uh, we all will say, hurt people hurt people. Have you ever heard that before? Uh, hurt people hurt people. But we also understand that Jesus says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. And so with that, he went on to say that free people, free people. And there's something very liberating when forgiveness happens in our life, when we've been forgiven, but we also have the burden uh, that Jesus places upon us to forgive people. And again, there's a certain freedom that comes with that. And I, I want to read out of Matthew chapter 6 here today. This is going to be up on the screen. Um, and uh, you can also use the, uh, your own Bible or the Bibles in the seats uh, in front of you. But this is Jesus' words right after... The, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, right after what we call the Lord's Prayer. Or he already talked about forgiveness, but he goes on to say, If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now, question. Was Jesus realistic when he said, um, Hey, if you forgive people, you're going to be forgiven, but if you don't forgive, God's not going to forgive your sins. <laughs> uh, I'm going to put that, that one on you. Thank you. That's a hard question. So, um, that, is, is it fair, right? Is it realistic for Jesus to say, look, you have to forgive others if, if your Heavenly Father, if you want Him to forgive you? So this is built right on the end of, uh, of the, the Lord's Prayer, right? This is, you know, forgive us our, 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 our sins of, as we forgive those who sin against us and don't lead us into temptation, forgive us, but, but lead us, you know, deliver us from evil. And then talks about this, this forgiveness thing. Talks about you, you have to forgive if you want your father to forgive you. I, I think it's realistic because it, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, but I think it's realistic because what, what you're looking at here is, it's like a parent who's talking to their kid, right? I tell my kids as they're learning to drive, you have to stop at the stop sign. Because if you don't, there are going to be things that happen beyond what it is that you think that you expect. If you don't stop at the stop sign, it may be fine right now, but sooner or later it's not going to be fine. And when I'm teaching my kids how to drive, if you've done that, you know how stressful that can be, right? As I'm teaching my kids how to drive, um, I don't find myself being gracious with stop signs. I don't say, hey, you know the ones with the white trim around those? Those are optional. As long as you honk, everything's okay. Um, because there is death on the other side of it. Sooner or later, it's going to kill you. And I, this is a scary point that Jesus is making here because the reality is, and I think this is what we're going to see as we go along with this, when we don't forgive, it kills our heart. Right? It, 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 it leads us to a place where we have a hard time with every relationship that we have. And when we don't forgive, we have a hard time with our relationship with God. 
because in unforgiveness, if I find myself angry with you, right, and we're going we're gonna to see this here in just, in just a second, but if I find myself being angry with you, sooner or later, I'm going to find myself being angry with God for creating someone like you. My relationship, my relationship with you is going to taint that relationship with God. And we're, that's not even talking about ultimately how much I, much I am, not God. am not God in the way that I love people or what I deserve. Um, but that's the thing that I think we see. And so Jesus is, he doesn't pull any punches. And, and he's very stern. But we're going to see why, I think, as we go along here. Let's just, let's just dig in. I think as we go, I do want to say, um, say, going along with this, that there's a couple things we need to uh, to think about here, though. There, our world talks about forgiveness, and we, we talked about this. Um, there's, there's three different ways that we're pressured to forgive, and I want to deal with that today. We're pressured to, to non-conditionally forgive, like um, just, just, just let it go and walk away. Have you guys ever heard that in the church? Just let something go, forget it, it's done, it's over, you can't do anything about it anyway, just let it go and, and, and walk away. We don't actually see that necessarily in Scripture. We also see pressure to, like, in our culture to transactionally forgive. Like, I will forgive you if you first come and apologize to me. As long as you come and apologize, then we're all going to be good. That's actually not necessarily what we see biblically either. And also we're going to see all the time in our culture this idea that forgiveness is a bad thing. Um, we shouldn't forgive anybody at all because nobody's going to hold anybody accountable. Um, but I think what we're going to see, what we see from Jesus, is something that's bigger than that. And, and, like, you, you had a conversation with that, so I dig in on that. Okay, so... Um, we actually, we actually uh, Jim and I, uh, in a group of text, actually got a text um, about, um, we'll get into the nitty gritty of it all, but uh, does a person need to ask for forgiveness? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and so on like that, and, and so on. And in and, and many instances, what uh, people will end up doing uh, is through manipulation saying, well, the Bible tells, uh, tells us that you are supposed to forgive, so you just got to forgive me. And, and, and again, it's used as a manipulation tool and so on like that. But um, I, again, uh, I think one of the best books uh, outside of the Bible is Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. So I, I used to say, and I won't say this, but if I were God, and you better thank God that I'm not God, you would need to read the Bible and Mere Christianity to get into heaven. Uh, it's that good of a book. But uh, one of the things that C.S. Lewis does in, um, uh, in, in, in the latter part of Mere Christianity, he, he starts going through uh, what you would call Christian virtue. And he begins to talk, one, one of his chapters was on sexual immorality. And he, he would say uh, that many would presume that uh, the, the, the sexual propriety that we find in the Bible is the least favorite Christian virtue. But he argued against that saying, the least favorite of all Christian virtue is forgiveness. Uh, and, and, and I think that's one of the things that, that ends up happening is it's, so hard. Uh, we, I mean, I think all of us that have ever had anything to forgive, we kind of say it's really, really difficult. And the problem with that unforgiveness is, um, I'm going to try to say this, um, there's so many unintended consequences. Uh, when people refuse to forgive, they tend to bleed over everyone else. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll just say, though, I, I tell my kids, and I've told my kids this before, and I'll, I'll tell people this in, in private, and I'll go ahead and say, it here. Uh, you got to deal with your crap, or your crap is going to deal with you. Okay. Okay, uh, so that's that's um, that's you know, one of the things that I, I'll typically tell people. And when you don't, some of the unintended consequences, and not to be graphic, crap kind of goes everywhere. And so if you don't really do the the hard work of forgiveness, it, it tends to be kind of flung around indiscriminately with people all around you. And, and I love what C.S. Lewis said. Uh, forgiveness is a wonderful idea until you have something to forgive. Right. That, yeah, hey, I, 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 you know, we, we love this and we love the idea of forgiveness. Uh, but here's the reality, and I do not want to be harsh here. Every single one of us, every single one of us has something in our life that's been big. 
every single one of us every has single one of us has something in our life that uh, it might even be forgiving God. Um, it might be something that's kind of a, a, a long-standing sort of thing. It might be a trauma of some kind, but we all have something. And uh, when that trauma comes back up, or that that thing, that long-standing thing comes back up, it, it creates a lot of angst and anxiety. I actually had that happen uh, yesterday. I'm not going to get into the nitty-gritty details, but it was one of those things. Uh, I was on a uh, conversation with a family member. Uh, they relayed a story to me about something that was going on, and immediately... It, it, it all came, kind of came flooding back. Anybody been there? Okay. And so, okay. And, and so uh, I think Kyle made a really good point when he mentioned last week that Jesus, when he mentioned forgiveness, did so in, in not a dogmatic way, but an empathetic way. He, of all people, know uh, how, how, you know, how, how people can hurt people. But he, he of all people, knows what it is like to forgive big things. And so um, one of the things that Jesus did, uh, it's not the only time he talked about forgiveness. We're going to skip on a couple of pages over to Matthew uh, chapter 18. And remarkably, Matthew chapter 18 is a really a chapter about human relationships. Uh, it, it really, really is. And Jesus was very well aware of that. But um, this is uh, in chapter, uh, chapter 18, verse 21. This is the uh, unforgiving uh, debtor uh, is a parable that Jesus tells. But it begins with, with Peter. Uh, then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Uh, and Jesus uh, replied, no, not seven times, but... Seventy-seven times, or um, it depends on how you read this in the Greek language. It might actually read uh, seventy times seven. So I, I've got an observation. In fact, I'm going to drop some observations about Matthew 18, and then Jim's going to uh, kind of close up with with um, Romans uh, chapter 12. But um, here's what I think Peter does. Uh, Peter is like. Hey, Lord, and you know, you just talked about the problems in human relationships. Uh, so, like, if I forgive somebody seven times, I'm good, right? Thinking I've accomplished all that I need to do. And, and, and so Peter is spiritually arrogant at this point, thinking he's got it all figured out. And I actually think that what we tend to do uh, in our human relationship is we tend to exaggerate our own personal righteousness and downplay the personal righteousness of others. So, so, so Peter's trying to put himself up here on a pedestal saying, Ah, look at me. I forgave John because John and Peter kind of have that little thing going on. I forgave him seven times and I'm good, right? And so Jesus says what? He says, no, no, not seven times, but seven, 77 or 70 times seven. So 70 times seven, that's 409 times. So then I'm good, right? So if I can just do that. No, the, the picture that, that Jesus is saying is seven is the number of completeness, right? And, and when Jesus then says 77 or 70 times seven, he's saying it's, and this is painful again, it's an infinite number of times, right? Right, it's, it's a, this idea of perfection done in the way that I am striving to rebuild or keep this relationship from my end in a healthy place. Um, which again, we're going to have to get a little further in here because that can easily sound like manipulation, right? Mm -hmm. like, like Jesus is just saying, no, you just got to get over it. But he's not saying just get over it. This is what makes the next part so important, I think. Um, is he's not saying, no, Peter, you're, you're good, job good job trying to think that way. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you think you only have to forgive seven times, but now you're going to have to just keep going and going and going and taking it. Now, what he says here is tied into this next thing. And I think we really need to look at this parable in Matthew 18 uh, because what we see here is really the relationship with God and why Jesus says what he says. I want to, before we jump in, we're going to read verses 23 and 24 in just a second. But I've got two things to say uh, about 70 times 7 that I just want you to kind of process in your mind. I want you to chew on this here for a moment. 
um, because I think 70 times 7 means difficult people will continue to be difficult people in your life. I, I, I mean, a, a lot of times, and in fact, I'll, I'll say this at the end, C.S. Lewis said basically the idea of Christian virtue implies community. You cannot say that you're loving by yourself. It implies that you're going to be in, in, in connection with people. And sometimes people, and my wife will use this term, are just itchy. You know, they're, 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 you know, they're, 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 they're just kind of like that. And, and, and so I, I think we don't get the opportunity to write people off. In fact, how many times do we just want to say we just want to write people off? Okay, but here's the deal. I think difficult people will continue to be difficult people. God has created different personalities. And sometimes personalities don't jive together. And so that is a reality. But Jesus doesn't give us an out of saying, just push them out of your life. You may, and I think uh, logically it may mean that we need to set up some boundaries. Yeah. However, a couple of uh, other items here. Uh, with that, I think 70 times 7, I think Jesus is, um, is really kind of telling us to continually to lean in uh, to the act of forgiveness. That we tend to put forgiveness as kind of like plan B. Okay, if, if, if they've been a jerk to the point where they're not ever going to change, well, I suppose I'm just going to forgive them. Uh, and, and I don't think that leaning into forgiveness means that I walk around going, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you, or anything like that. But I do believe that we fight for it, and we, we wrestle uh, to achieve forgiveness. And so when I say this, here's one of the things I, I want you to get. There are people that have hurt you in so many unimaginable ways. Um, Jim and I, I don't know, I know Jim has shared uh, a little bit about his life. Uh, I know that um, about 25, 27 years ago, um, I had a member of my church threaten my life. And, um, and, um, and he continued to be a member of my church. And, and, so and, and so having to work through that, there's, there's difficult things that we have to work through. And so I'm just going to offer that, um, that this might mean that we're going to have to do some heavy lifting. It doesn't mean that you just kind of like all of a sudden one day wake up and go, okay, I'm done. Um, this might mean, in fact, I'll just say, at bare minimum, get into a small group. Talk to this guy right here. But being in a small group is a, I, I think, just a beautiful place for discipleship and learning how to do life with people. And it's a place for accountability. But also here, um, I think it might mean that you need to have a spiritual advisor or maybe even professional counseling to get to that place uh, where you are able to begin the process of forgiveness. But Jesus tells a parable. Tells a parable uh, of, of a guy that owed a lot of money. In fact, verses 23 and 24. It says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring uh, his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. Um, in the process, one of his debtors uh, was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. Now, I just want you to think about the anxiety that you might have right now if, let's just say, mortgage, car payment, all of these different things kind of came in and banks said, okay, now we're calling it into account. How many of you got a little bit of anxiety right now? Uh, okay, so uh, okay, so we understand that sometimes we owe more than what we can feasibly pay. This man owed millions. And the king said, if you can't pay, you're going to jail. And the man pleaded with the king. And this isn't up here on the screen, but I want you to notice verse 27. Then his master was filled with pity for him and released, released him and forgave his debt. So I want you to think millions here as we get into verse 28. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. 
Which would you rather? Uh, Which would you rather uh, owe? A couple of thousand or a couple of million? Okay. Okay. A couple thousand. And what this man did? And what this man did to the man who owed him money was reprehensible. Was reprehensible. He demanded. He demanded money. The money that was owed him. So he had. So he had rage. And unforgiveness. Right after he was shown pity. And forgiveness. So I think there's a couple of items that I just wanted you to chew on here. One is this. My sin and rebellion against God is far more grievous than any offense that people will commit against me. That's what Jesus is getting at. The debt that we owe God is bigger than what we can grasp in our mind. I'll even go as far as what David said when he sinned uh, in, uh, with Bathsheba, he committed adultery and he murdered her husband and so on like that. In Psalm 51, he says against you and you only. He realized that ultimately his sin was against God. So my sin against God is bigger than anything that anyone is going to visit upon me. But I think what Jesus is getting at, if God can forgive the totality of my sin, I think that's the big picture, the totality of our sin, I should be willing to forgive people who have sinned against me. So here's the question. We will sit here and nod our heads, and then we will fight against this. Why? And I'm going to say why. Why do we? Because I would be included in we. Why do we fight against this so hard? Look, I, I, even as you're saying the totality of my sin does not match up to the, you know, the, the things that have been done to me, what I hear is downplaying of these terrible things that have happened. Right? So I, I know rationally, you know, because I know I'm probably not even going to make it through the next hour without saying or doing something that is a sin, without saying or doing something stupid. Anybody going to make it all day without sinning? Okay, that's it. Okay, that's it. Right, not one of us, right? Um, Football's not on. I'm, 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 I'm better shape, right? I'm head that way, so. Yeah. The reality is we, we, we sin every day, but I have not done anything in my mind equal to some stuff that's happened to me. Right. Um, I'm not a victim, but I haven't done anything in my mind equal to what's been done. And so I tend to push back and I tend to argue, but what you're saying is exactly that. Um, this man who was uh, forgiven everything uh, still felt vindicated and, and, and the righteous indignation towards this other man who had done something wrong to him. But not to the same, but not to the same constant extent, you know, constant extent is what he had done, what he had done in racking up that million, millions of dollars debt. And, 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 and so when God knows the totality of our sin, we, we have to understand that um, he has taken that weight off of our shoulders if we follow him. And so we've been set free. That feeling of being set free is a feeling that can only exist. When we're setting others free as well, this man was then stuck underneath that burden, and I think that's where this is this, 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 why the Romans 12 thing is a big um, 12 is a chapter that is built around interpersonal relationships as well, but it's built around what God has already done for us. It's Romans 12 1. Therefore, my brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Because of what God has done for you, this is what you do. And in Romans 12, at the end of Romans 12, uh, we see, starting in verse 17, um, Paul sharing along the lines of what Jesus hears, how it is that we can live differently. So check out Romans 12, verse 17 to 21. It's on the screen here. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are on a roll. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone, dear friends. Never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge and I will pay them back 
says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Do not let evil conquer you, but conquer evil with good. Paul takes what we see in our relationships, and he says, look, if, if you're struggling to forgive, understand that God knows what it is that's happened more than you do. God knows what it is that's been done even more than you do. And so trust him with that. Our responsibility, and this is what really builds on what Jesus is saying, our responsibility is to, as much as it depends on us, live at peace with everyone. Right, to, 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 not to not pay back evil with more evil. Right, to, to, not, right, to, to not ramp it up because ultimately you're never going to find peace by just punching somebody in the face harder. Right, you may get them to shut up, but you're not going to get them to stop. And what Paul is saying is built on what Jesus is saying. Our responsibility is to, as much as I can, live at peace with people. That doesn't mean it's always going to be easy, but to live at peace with people and to step off the judgment seat. And I think this is the key to forgiveness. And this is really what Tim Hill talks about in, in, in his book on forgiveness. What theologians throughout history have talked about when we talk about forgiveness is it's not that forgiving someone means that whatever happened didn't happen. It just means that I no longer expect you to repay the debt that you owe me. I am going to step away from the judgment seat. I'm going to step down from the judgment seat, and I'm going to let God step into the judgment seat. I'm going to let him be the judge, because he is a better judge than I am. And I'm going to let him decide how this goes from here. So if he ultimately wants that person to have to pay for the things that he or she has done, that's going to be his choice. But he is better than I am at doing that. So ultimately what forgiveness is, if we do things in that way, is, is, is really an issue of faith. Right? It's an issue of, of trusting God and trusting that he is a good judge and saying, okay, I'm, I'm going to let you do this. When you understand that, you're able to then step off that seat on it, and, and the truth is you're still eating the debt. But you're stepping off that seat saying, I don't need you to pay me back. As you said here a while back, you said Tara said something about it. There are some times that people just aren't going to tell you they're sorry. Right? This is just the reality. But as you're walking around enslaved to that need to, say, to hear that, that thing, you're not free anymore. And so to be able to step back and say, I'm going to trust God with this. I'm going to trust that he is going to take care of this. He's going to deal with that person as he sees fit. Helps you to then ultimately be able to be compassionate. It doesn't mean you have to just put yourself right back in, in harm's way. But it allows you to be compassionate towards somebody and to not ramp up the wrongs that are being done by adding to that person's wrongs your own as well. Um, and so ultimately, it, it's a faith issue, right? I mean, that's what it is. Um, then you have to, to find yourself um, with some really hard questions. So there, there's a question that we, we have to do here, right? Do we trust God's judgment? Right? Do I ultimately have enough faith in God? Do I have enough faith in God to trust Him with those who have wronged me? Do I trust God enough to have faith in him, to say he's going to deal with that person, and so I'm going to let this be? And if the answer is yes, then there's freedom there that's available, that, that is impossible with anything else, right? Meditation doesn't fix it. It doesn't make the pain go away. We can try medication. Some of us have tried to medicate our forgiveness issues. Um, forgetting people, forgetting the problem doesn't make it go away. Actual forgiveness doesn't say that it didn't happen. It just means I don't need to be repaid. Um, and this is, this is where this happens here, right? That, that ultimately Jesus is going to come back. And when he came the first time, he came as a suffering servant. Um, when Jesus comes back um, at the end of time, he's going to come as the ultimate judge. And I'm going to trust him to right the wrongs that have been done. Um, and that's why all the way back to, the, to Matthew 6, he has to say, you have to forgive because ultimately, if not, it's a burden that trashes our hearts and it makes us really struggle to be able to love the people around us in the way that God has called us to. We get stuck in a place where we are under the burden of what somebody else has done to us. And we are enslaved. So,
So the idea of trusting God and allowing him to do what he will do as just and loving God uh, in the future is a hard thing for us to do. But I want to say this. Um, we stink at justice. We really do. Um, in, in fact, uh, you know, I've always, and I've already said it once here today, like Chuck Swindoll said, you know, if I were God, Right, uh, and you better thank God that I'm not God, because we stink at being God. We really, we really, really do. And in fact, one of the reasons why we stink at this so bad is we can't separate ourselves. And uh, there's actually, and I, I love it when when medical science kind of goes and says, yeah, we're just going to prove um, biblical sort of things here. But here's why we're not good at justice. When we're angry, our cognitive abilities decline. In fact, they've, they've said that uh, a person can lose 15-ish uh, or more IQ points when they're angry. And so I'm thinking, I don't have that many to spare. You know? <laughs> so the reality comes into play that when we are connected to it and we want to lower the boom, we, we're not thinking clearly. And God is, is infinitely perfect. And he sees the big picture. Uh, and he will be just and he will be loving uh, in his judgment. So um, here's something that I, I do want to ask. And we're going to close with a couple of questions. What happens when we carry the burden of forgiveness? Because God has created us as mon uh, body, mind, soul, spirit. You know, all of the. You know, He's created us as whole beings. What does it do to us? Because we're because we're really bad at this, right? Um, it, it becomes a point of, of, and you guys know, stress, anxiety. Um, you know the feeling of walking into Walmart, seeing the person that it is that you're struggling to forgive, and then saying, "I'm going to a different aisle." Never done that. <laughs> Ever. Right. We all know that, right. we all know that, that, that feeling, um, the feeling of, you know, going to a family event, the feeling of, I, I don't think I can do this, the feeling of waking up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat because of the memory of something that's happened. Um, and then the anger building. And it's, it's, it's like a cancer, but it goes further than that, right? It, it, it passes down where I come from a long line of this. Um, and it passes down generationally um, from one to another. Back and think of at least one parent the same thing. And you can think back if you're if you're honest. It probably is a cancer that may have been in the family for a long time. And that's why it's commanded Jesus says Christians most are. It, it's hard because it hits us physiologically. We end up with ulcers. We end up stressed. We end up tired. Um, but it also hits us psychologically because it paints our other relationships in a way that it's up to you. So it ultimately is hard, right? Because you're eating a debt. In the short term, we are eating a debt. Um, but Jesus is clear that um, the, the only way to get to the place where we don't worry requires us to be in a place where we don't carry around the bitterness of unforgiveness. So in a couple of weeks, we will actually have a sermon on do not worry. But it's interesting that Jesus says, therefore do not worry. And it's almost like, like giving and, and serving to, to not be seen, but just do this out of your, your personal devotion to God is a great way to, to let worry come out of your life. There's a lot of things that Jesus talks about, prayer and fasting and forgiveness and understanding uh, money and its proper place in our lives. All of those things contribute to the do not worry. And, you know, I, I actually this morning, um, please understand, I didn't write my sermon this morning uh, or anything like that, but this morning I was reading um, a, a thing because um, I'm in a place where I'm eating right and I'm exercising, have been for a while, uh, but I, I'm still carrying around a little bit more weight than I normally do. And uh, so I was reading an article, different things like that, and it said, take stress out of your life. 
yeah, we're not meant to, yeah, we're not meant to carry stress. Right. Right. Really and not. And forgiveness is a stress that, that, that comes into us. So uh, I think we also need to grapple with uh, with this here. How do we move toward forgiveness? I, I know for me, um, moving toward forgiveness oftentimes means that I have to remember my depravity. I have to remember that there are probably, maybe some of y'all in the room right now, like Brandon is a son of a gun. You know, people walking around um, holding grudges and, and being unwilling to forgive me. That I've probably done things sometimes intentionally, but most often unintentionally, where I've hurt people. And so I have to remember my own depravity. And then, and then I have to wrestle. I sometimes have to say, God, I don't want to forgive this person. I don't want to let this go. But I'm going to trust that you're God. I'm going to trust that you're able uh, to, to do a whole lot better job than me. Yeah, and, and ultimately, it, it's in that trust, um, some things that we can do. Because uh, biblically, it's not just suck it up and take it. Actually, Jesus talks about when somebody sinned against you, go to that person. And say something. And there's a good chance that that person is going to, could respond negatively. But we don't know that. Right? We assume the worst. Um, and actually, Matthew 18, Jesus says, go to that person. If that person doesn't let it go, then, then go with somebody else. Um, and then ultimately, uh, in that same way, continue that process. And the goal ultimately is, get to, is to get to the place where um, we are growing together, even when somebody's going to be hard. But we're growing together towards God and towards each other, to the place where our relationships are, are built on the fact that I love God and I know that he loves me. And because he loves me, he trusts me enough to be in a relationship with you, even though maybe it's not working the way that I would want it to work. Um, ultimately, I can't fix what other people are doing. Um, but I can be the type of person who is different because of what I'm giving me. So really, forgiveness is our move, right? Forgiveness is something else that somebody can do. You can't wait for somebody to come and repent. Um, but we can move forward, and we can be the people who lead in this. And as a as a church, as a people, um, when we are that, when we live that way, there's a freedom that isn't available anywhere else. No one else can make this happen for us. But Jesus has already done it for us. And so he's the one who can work through this in us. So um, we're going to close um, out our service today with just um, a time of communion and uh, just a time to praise. And uh, as we go, come and take communion. Uh, communion is here on the table. It's in the seats in front of you. You're more than welcome to come forward uh, or you can uh, stay where you are. But I just ask you to just have a time. A lot of times I, I, I will say, God, forgive me for my sin. But I realize that God has moved toward forgiveness in my life, and um, and all things considered, I owe him millions. And I want you to think, don't just generically throw out your sin here today and say, God, thank you for forgiving my sin. In your heart, in your mind, say, God, forgive me for... And name some biggies in your life. You don't have to shout them out. Say them in your head. But name some of those sins that God has forgiven in your life. Let's go ahead and go to God in prayer. Father, thank you. And thank you so much for the gift of grace through the forgiveness that was given to us on the cross. God, thank you. God, thank you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.